Hello, everybody. Welcome to the EU ADS Symposium Data, Social Media and Society. My name is Christian Welter. I'm head of communication at Statec, Luxembourg's official statistic institute. I will lead you through the program today. Before I give the floor to Professor Peter Flach, here are a few housekeeping notes before we get started. We have many people following our live event, so please make sure that your microphone is muted. Also note that this conference will be recorded and shared on the website of the EU ADS. If you do not wish to appear in the video, please switch off your camera now. During the presentation, you can type all the questions in the chat room. Professor Pantheon will address questions and comments during the Q&A session at the end. Now, let me introduce our first speaker. It is with special excitement that I'm pleased to welcome Professor Peter Flach. Peter is a professor of artificial intelligence at the University of Bristol an internationally leading researcher in the areas of mining, highly structured data, and the evaluation and improvement of machine learning models. He has also published on the logic and philosophy of machine learning and on the methodology of data science. Professor Flach's current profile lists more than 300 publications. He is the author of Simply Logical, Intelligence Reasoning by Example, and Machine Learning, the Art and Science of Algorithms that Make Sense of Data, which has established itself as a key reference in machine learning. Professor Flach was a founding board member of the European Association for Data Science, EUADS, and was elected president in 2018. He is a fellow of the Alan Turing Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. Since April 2019, he directs a newly established center for doctorate training in interactive artificial intelligence. Please join me in welcoming Professor Peter Flach. Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Christian, for the kind introduction. I hope that everybody can hear me. I will attempt to share the right window here. Let's see what happens. So that should be this one. <clears throat> Let me make it full screen as well. Okay, so I hope that this projects okay. If not, then please do interrupt me. Um, so I am today's warm up act, so I will keep it brief because you didn't come here for me. You came here for, uh, for Sandy Pantland, who will follow my brief introduction. So I, <clears throat> I'm speaking as the current president of the European Association for Data Science, and I want to say a few words about who we are and, and what we do. So I'll start with talking a little bit about the uh, association's mission. So we have, uh, we, we recently formulated a mission, mission statement, and we have six elements there, <clears throat> which I will talk around briefly a little bit. So. So to begin with, what is data science and how can it be a force for good? Well, data and knowledge are really the two pillars on which our ability to understand and interact with the world around us rests. So data can broadly be described as a vehicle for describing the world around us, what's going on through factual information about events, situations, circumstances, developments, changes in the world, and so on. Knowledge is the carrier of understanding the world. And this, in data science, knowledge can both be an input because we need knowledge in order to make sense of data, but knowledge is also produced by data science. And data science as a discipline is evolving as a kind of new meta discipline from uh, a variety of existing disciplines which includes disciplines such as computer science, mathematics, statistics, machine learning, and so on, but also data-driven applications in other domains, such as psychology, social science, economics, uh, you name it. Basically, uh, the 21st century uh, university has as its credo that every, every scientific discipline produces data, analyzes data, and needs data science. And, and data science is then this interplay of data and knowledge by which we then produce value in a variety of forms. So the value produced by data science can take a potentially unlimited number of forms, but 
of course, it needs to be guided by considerations how to do this responsibly and ethically. So, for example, uh, in scientific applications, the main value lies in, in novel scientific knowledge uh, and models. And the main beneficiaries here are scientists. But in other application areas, the beneficiaries can be society as a whole, organizations and companies, groups and individuals, and, and very often combinations of these. And this is where it gets interesting because often the results of data science can have different value for different beneficiaries. For example, uh, data may have commercial value for a company, but it may also at the same time impinge on the privacy of individuals. So the extent to which data science can be a force for good depends crucially on a transparent appreciation of its effects on all actors in the relevant ecosystem and on appropriate mitigation of any unwanted effects. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, this, this, uh, this links quite clearly to, uh, uh, to today's main talk about um, uh, social networks and, and, and uh, the, the benefits and the risks of uh, what is going on there and how we, how we can understand it and, and, and uh, uh, deal with it responsibly. So as we, as, as the association for European Association for Data Science, consider it as a, our main mission to inform and unite the European data science community in all its facets. So exactly because we operate in such a highly multidimensional, multidisciplinary ecosystem uh, with many stakeholders, uh, there is scope and benefits for a professional organization that aims to build bridges and, and balance interests. Um, but of course, this is data science is a very young subject, and I will say a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, so it, it, the information about resources, opportunities, best practices is scattered. Uh, it's sometimes hard to find, and and this is where an organisation like EU ADS has uh, finds its main opportunities. Uh, we will use uh, a combination of different channels and activities. For example, we have recently set up um, uh, uh, a Slack workspace for members. Uh, we organize networking events such as this ones. We uh, have set uh, made first steps towards uh, organizing information brokerage platforms, and that can be seen as sometimes as two-way marketplaces. We organize events. Uh, we have started to uh, think about uh, things like blog posts and so on, uh, online videos. So really, information obviously is, is a key, key component of what we do. Uh, why European? Well, it's, you know, we, 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 are not, we are not a political organization, but we feel that particularly in Europe, uh, there's a lot of scope of um, 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 guiding the, the very diverse uh, European uh, uh, landscape and make sure that information is shared in the right way uh, so that we can foster equality and diversity, environmental preservation, socioeconomic developments and all these things. Um, so as I said, we don't consider ourselves a political organization, but we do aim to inform policymakers and legislators and promote the availability of curated data and also encourage data science literacy. And that's, I think we all agree in the time of, 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 of COVID, uh, correctly interpreting the data and, and, and getting the knowledge out of the data and doing it in a responsible way is, is very important. So here are some of the activities that we've uh, organized uh, in, in our existence. So there is, uh, there is a series of European conferences on data analysis. It was the most recent one that just finished uh, was, was a week or so ago in Rotterdam, but it was an online event, of course. We've organized our own conference, which was an invitation only conference in Luxembourg. Out of that came a special issue. We organized the first European summer school on explainable data science. That was actually in Luxembourg two years ago. And we uh, had the intention of making that an annual event, but uh, we all know what happened, COVID happened. Uh, so we're hoping to organize the next summer school uh, in the summer of 2022. 
2022, and that will be on data science for social media. So original, originally today's symposium would have been the opening event for the summer school, uh, but we decided to delay the summer school because summer schools are particularly uh, beneficial if they are face-to-face -face events, uh, but we wanted to go ahead with this event as an online, online event. So how can you get involved? Well, you can become a member, you can uh, convince your organization to become an institutional member. Um, we are thinking about establishing uh, national representatives. And if you want to discuss that further, then please get in touch. You can help us organize events. You can help us disseminate information. You can help us uh, put blogs online. You can make suggestions. So please uh, do consider getting in touch if you're, if you're interested in, 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 uh, in, in being part of, of, of this organization. Okay, I will uh, say a few brief things about how I see uh, data science to be different because you could say, well, we've had data mining for maybe 25 years or so. How is data science different from data mining? Here's a picture that uh, some of you may have seen. This is CRISPDM, which comes out of the uh, tail end of the 20th century, you could say. It stands for cross industry, uh, cross industry. Um, I forget what the S stands for, um, process for data mining. Apologies for that. It's, it's such a well-known thing that you forget what the acronym actually stands for. And it has this, this, this typical six steps of business understanding. You have to understand what it is that you're trying to do. You have data understanding. You have to understand what your data is like. Then you do data preparation, you do modeling, you evaluate evaluate your models and then you um, you deploy it. And by the way, I know what the S stands for now. It is standard, cross-industry standard for process of data mining. Um, so here's a picture of how I think this has evolved a little bit. So uh, there, around this core of CRISPM and many processes are still pretty much satisfy that picture if you know exactly what you want to do, but there is, kind of it becomes an onion with an with an outer outer shell of more exploratory activities so you may want to explore the source of your data because you have different choices you may want to explore what your goal is because you may have data but you haven't quite decided what to do with it you may want to explore where the value resides in the data you may want to explore how best to communicate your results and, and turn it into a narrative so that's when we came up with this idea of, of uh, trajectories. And so data science projects can follow quite different tra trajectories uh, through this space where, for example, there might not be, uh, you go from data preparation to modeling, but then you go to exploring how the models can be turned into a product. And this is actually, there's more on this uh, when I gave this similar talk two years ago. We had a symposium then with Christopher Bishop, well-known machine learning author and also a director of Microsoft Research in Cambridge. Uh, and I gave a somewhat longer talk where I talked a little bit about this and, and the slides are there uh, at that URL. Okay, I will, uh, uh, I'm about to wrap up. I want to say something about why is this the Sabine krolak uh lecture? Sabine was really the, uh, the, the driving force behind the association. So Sabine was um, the first, uh, the, the founding president of the association. Um, she was an educational psychologist by training uh, but she saw very clearly the value of interdisciplinarity and connecting many different disciplines in order to, to get to a place where the individual disciplines wouldn't be able to get, uh, get to themselves. Sabine uh, passed away way too early uh, in 2017, and that's when we decided to start this uh, symposium series in her honor. 
And finally, um, it is my uh, great pleasure to uh, to introduce our main speaker of today, Alex Sandy Pentland, uh, the, the the proverbial man who doesn't uh, doesn't need an introduction. So I won't uh, try to I won't try too hard. Um, there is a, his website lists an incredible uh, amount of uh, achievements and activities. And so, which I will summarize by saying that I think Sandy Pentland is 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 a genuine kind of uh, polymath, a genuine uh, Renaissance man, if you want to call it that way. The the breadth of activities that he's uh, that he's been involved with is uh, is is incredible, but also very interesting to look at. So, for example, um, particularly if you're in Europe you are uh, familiar with uh, GDPR and its effects and, and how uh, the European Union is thinking about th uh, things like privacy. And Sandy had something to do with that, uh, uh, with, with, with how uh, GDPR came about. He has been involved in many spin-off companies. Um, he has been looking at uh, issues in, in cyber attacks and fraud, all these things within the concept of social networks. Of course, he has been looking at uh, COVID data and uh, trying to analyze mobility patterns, which are of course an important um, uh, carrier of the spread of, of infections. And, and you know th these are things that uh, require deep analysis in order to understand it more. He just told me before this, uh, uh, before we started the meeting, that um, he did some research in the use of masks and how they would result in an estimated ten percent reduction in death rate, which of course is 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 significant. Um, and and so there is so much discussion about masks. I'm very aware of that because today in the UK we have just decided that COVID is officially over and that the government doesn't need to tell us anymore what to do. So it's left to uh, left to personal initiative. And that you know that's that's fine in itself, perhaps as long as people have the data, have the knowledge, and know what the effects are. So this is this is all. These are all important things. Uh, and, and we are very fortunate that people of the stature of Sandy Pentland are, are looking at these kind of issues. And before I hand over, I wanted to just say that um, we are very pleased with the uh, with the participation today. Uh, when we looked at the registrations on Friday, we had registrations from 30 countries, 30, with the top countries, top number of registrations coming from the UK, Germany. Luxembourg, uh, Brazil, Italy, the US, Croatia, and Portugal, with, as you would expect, quite a long tail further. But we're really, really pleased that, uh, and if anything good is coming out of this pandemic, it is that these meetings are, are being made easier. And so we are, we, are, we are making more connections worldwide, which is great. So, um, I will end there. So, um, please do get in touch uh, with with any of us if you want to be a part of this of this association. Thank you very much for uh, for joining. Um, Sandy will talk for about an hour, and then we will have plenty of time for uh, for questions. So, as Christian said, please start the questions in your in the chat in a way that they will probably have to be relayed by me. So um, so, so please please be succinct, but also provide enough detail that, that it's clear what the question is about and we'll, we'll, we'll take it from there. And with that, uh, Sandy, over to you. And thanks very much for uh, agreeing to speak today. Well, thank you very much mm -hmm. for inviting me. And I hope that uh, I can be as interesting as your introduction made it sound that uh, I have the potential to be. So let me just sort of dive in um, and uh, explain things along the way. Please put uh, questions in the chat and let's see if we can get started here. Sure, I have the right one here. Okay, so that should be it. 
Um, so because this was supposed to be a summer school about social media and communication, I chose this title, but I'm actually gonna cover a lot of different I'm gonna cover uh, human decision-making and how you can make it better uh, in things like finance, yeah, I'm going to look at cyber attack, I'm going to look at a number of things, all of which are network phenomena. And uh, that's been the theme of my work now for 15, 20 years, is uh, the realization that most of the way we manage ourselves and conceive of ourselves is focused around individual actors and not around uh, the networks. And of course, this was natural because it was very difficult to get data about everybody in the network at the same time. But with the advent of cell phones and digital media, it became much, much easier. And so a lot of the classical things, sociology, psychology, finance, economics, all are being revisited with this new perspective. And that's what I wanna talk about today. Um, so the, the problem of concern that I'll start with uh, and then expand out from is that social media seems to be degrading individual and community decision-making. We seem to have more panics, poor decisions, lots of crazies, uh, things that, that really degrade our ability to act as a society. And this is true both within corporation uh, as well as in broader society. And you can even argue that this is one of the things that you're seeing between nation states. Um, to really understand what's going on though, we need to understand very deeply how people make decisions. Because at the end of the day, these networks are populated by people and the people are making decisions. And as I said, the classical understanding of people has not been a network centric understanding. It's been an individual centric. Um, so let me just start here with the social media um, and something that's surprising to people. People talk about fake news and how it's a problem, but in fact, people are able to recognize fake news quite accurately. So this is for the US, but it's looking at both the right wing and the left wing and people are very able to accurately identify fake news, hyperpartisan news, and mainstream um, when you ask them. Uh, and in fact, they're as good as the official fact-checking services. Uh, and the agreement among these things has a kappa, if you know that statistic, of around uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, which isn't very good, which means People are able to tell when things are fake, but they're not able to really tell which things to pay good attention to and really rely upon. Or at least there's a lot of disagreement about that. And, and so the question then is, is if we're pretty good at understanding our world when asked, uh, why don't we act that way? <laughs> because we certainly don't. Um, and I think that the core thing is that we misunderstand how we make decisions. So this is this sort of classic model that is dominant uh, everywhere, certainly in the Western world, but just generally. It's focused on an individual and not so much on their context. And there's this idea of rational individuals. People debate about rationality. That means uh, uh, being able to seek for your own good, of course, but they don't debate so much about the word individual. And that's where I would place my question mark. This is, do we actually act as individuals or not? To what extent are we part of a network? And that dictates what we do with the rational individual part being only at the edges. And I uh, uh, would argue that that picture of us being social creatures is much more true than the rational individual one. And that it's the source of most of the wisdom and cultural progress that differentiates humans from other animals. So let me back that up. First thing to notice is, is that 
We have all of this work about system one and system two, Daniel Kahneman, Nobel Prize, uh, which points out that there is an older, phylogenetically older system that we have uh, for very quick decisions. So when you're forced to make jump one way or another, you can't think through, you know, deductively weigh the evidence. You have to move immediately. And what we, of course, have is we have lots of routines, habits, stereotypes, features that we pick out uh, and use for reacting to the current situation. And estimates uh, of this are that 95% of the actions that we take are this sort of unconscious, fast, associative uh, uh, type of thing. Uh, and only 5% is where we're thinking things through. Uh, and uh, actually, we're not so good at it. I have a little book at home where it lists 276 types of common error in three sentence syllogisms. So that's pretty appalling that in three sentences you can blow it 276 ways, but it's true. Um, so many people are familiar with this. This is the source of behavioral economics is that there's biases in the system. So they're still clinging to the rational individual model, but now they're saying that there's biases. But in fact, um, this rational thinking depends on facts. Okay, we're worried about fake news and so forth. But the system one is programmed by social influence. So where did you get these rules that you act so automatically at? Well, they came typically from copying other people, learning other people. Uh, and this is, of course, cultural transmission. It's why we have culture. It's good. It's not bad. It isn't perfect, of course. And so it's really important to understand this in some depth when you begin to think about decision making, either to make your company systems work better, to understand society, or for whatever purposes. So let me go through that. So the core question is, how do we know what's true? And of course, a lot of the standard sort of academic models are essentially rational individuals. They look at features and then they figure out the probability of something being true. And in fact, when we look at data from hundreds of thousands of financial traders, we see that this is a very accurately true. As people make this financial decisions, they are dramatically uh, influenced by the recent quantitative performance of each of the types of decisions. So when you look at an investment product, you ask, how has it done well? The better it does, the more likely people are to choose that one. And there is a bias at the loss end. So there's a loss aversion, which is, is that if you happen to own it, and it's doing terribly, you don't like to get rid of it and you do something which looks uh, as often described as un not being rational, uh, which is you make the decision to hold on to it for a little bit. It's probably not actually irrational because of course financial institutions, financial decisions are not stationary. The statistics change. So that could something that's bad could turn very positive. And in fact, this sort of swinging back and forth between low performance and high performance uh, was the basis of hedge fund performance. In fact, almost the main basis of hedge fund, hedge, hedge fund performance uh, for the first 20 years of hedge fund, mean reversion thing. It really works. But it's not just this quantitative analysis of facts. What people do, in fact, is something that's more close to portfolio theory. It's an optimal minimum regret strategy, which is known as Thompson sampling. The idea is, is you don't have infinite amounts of data because it's a non-stationary changeable world. You have to use recent data to be able to make decisions. You probably don't really have enough data. The data is noisy. You want to make the best choice you can with the minimum regret. How do you do that? Well, the core is still this rational consideration of the features, but is weighted by social priors. 
And this is true for all social animals, not just humans. We look at what others who are like us do, and if lots of people are doing it, that's a gives a high prior that this is a good decision. And you can imagine this in evolutionary terms. You're out there in the wild with a bunch of people, you see people eating blue uh, berries, you wait a little while and see if they get sick. You're minimizing your risk by learning from others. And this is this social uh, a learning, which is uh, uh, a uh, effect that builds uh, trends and uh, it's a, a, a it, it building sort of networks of people copying each other, right? Is in fact a tremendously good thing for making decisions. You get improvements in your decision making by using social things, social information that are often really startling. Um, and by multiplying, just simply multiplying the social probability of an action versus your analysis of recent quantitative performance of an action, you get an estimate of the posterior, which in many, many, many situations is an accurate one. And what you want to do, of course, is a portfolio. You want to bet the most, uh, or make the most frequent thing, the most uh, likely posterior, less likely, the next most likely is the less frequent thing that you do with a smaller bet and so on and so forth. And this extremely accurately describes people uh, financial decisions. And we have a paper in cognition just this year, how um, groups of people by sharing information can really achieve this sort of minimal regret strategy. Of course, it can be biased and you can screw up. And the most common way, as I'll point out, is in the social input. Uh, you can train people all you want, you can, can make them smart, but even then they'll be associated uh, and biased by the social hearings. So, for instance, we did an experiment with 2,000 mid-career financial professionals. These are the best decision makers in the world for finance as a class. We had them make 17,000 predictions of future movements, futures of major indices. And what we discovered was exactly that equation I showed in the past. But what experts were doing is, uh, could be described in a slightly different way. So when they were, the, some of the experts were much more quantitative and paid much less like uh, attention to the social. So they were much more the rational individual. And they in fact made more money by a very small amount than people who paid attention to the social uh, decisions, the decisions made by other traders. But their returns had very high variance, had a fairly poor sharp ratio. People, traders, professional traders who pay attention to what other traders are doing were able to minimize their risk and lower the standard deviation of their errors at the cost of a small amount of performance. So what financials do is they, experts do, is they use social learning to modulate their risk. And of course that in the long term is brilliant because Making a little bit more on each trade is good, but if you blow it big time sometimes, that just wipes out all those small gains. One of the major things you have to do in financial stuff, and I have started and run hedge funds, so I know a little bit about this, is you have to make sure you don't make big mistakes. That's almost your number one thing. And people use that in terms of uh, uh, using social input to do that. We have a paper that was in Entropy just this month that describes this in some detail. So uh, what is the greatest weakness of human decision-making? Well, it's the false appearance of consensus. The fact that we use this social input, this is how we build culture. We build learnings by trading with each other, right? This is how we get the priors to be able to make decisions with relatively small amounts of data. But if I modulate, distort that social input that you use as a prior, 
I can cause you to do all sorts of things. And there's famous experiments about um, Stanley Milgram about people doing just crazy things if the social pressure is uniform. Um, and this is where you get panics and fads and manias and cults and boot camps, books on this, and ISIS and Kristallnacht. Uh, so it's this distortion of social things, which is the main thing that we want to look out for. So um, let me just sort of emphasize this again. So this is a uh, bubble. This is the bubble from, um, say, what is it? Uh, 2017, 28 for Bitcoin overlaid on the bubble for NASDAQ, the major trading, uh, uh, tech trading forum uh, for the year 2000. And you can see that Bitcoin, which is famous for being crazy and having fads and panics and things, looks almost exactly like NASDAQ, except maybe it's a little better. Um, and, and so we, even the best of us, uh, the smartest, the forward-looking ones, the most cautious traders uh, get into these cascades. And this is arguably the major source of uh, problems in our world, these sorts of mass uh, delusions of various sorts. Um, and so the goal here is just to prevent these sorts of things. Now, we have a little bit of protective armor built in. Um, which when you look at recommendation sites, social media sites like Quora in the West, ones in the East, this happens to be on the uh, ones in the East, you find that uh, people have different status. So how much do you trust the recommendations? And in fact, the more diverse somebody's social network is, the more diverse and integrated of information they are, the higher status they have, and the more they're trusted. So strong social diversity is a built-in bias that humans have. We like people who are expert in lots of things. They're high status to us. Uh, and of course, that can be gained. But it gives us a little bit of protective. But unfortunately, not enough, as we have seen in the previous slide. Um, so it makes it a little more difficult. Uh, uh, and this is one of the more uh, common things that people suggest for curing decisions is to make sure that you have diverse opinions, right? So we actually have innately uh, or culturally a bias towards diversity, but it's not enough. It still happens. So recently we had a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, the U.S.'s uh, National Academy of Science, uh, where we showed a theorem uh, uh, about preferential attachment. So these are things that have social learning. People go to things that seem popular for other people. And this occurs in many things. There's in politics, I showed you some financial examples. Social media is crazy for this sort of thing. All sorts of things. And it turns out that you can show that the cascade dynamics, these fads, these, these crazy things that happen, depend on the distribution of fitness within the network and not on the leading guy. So we usually say, oh, Microsoft or, or Google and Facebook are too strong. We have to break them up. In fact, what that will do is create more Microsoft, more Googles, more uh, Facebooks, and leave us probably worse off. What you have to do is you have to raise up the entire distribution so that there aren't these outlier uh, uh, nodes that are, because that's where you run, run to winner take all. So you see this in politics too. You see it in finance. And this is the source of all these things. And um, there's nice domains in which you can say where cascades will happen and where they won't. So uh, as shown on the left here, if most traders have low fitness, you get a winner take all type of thing where these disproportionate agents uh, appear uh, and uh, they take advantage. And this is where cascades, this is where uh, demagogues happen, this is where financial crashes happen. 
If on the other hand, the fitness has a much broader distribution so that there are many fit agents, you get an agent where a place where you get very stable dynamics and you get much more innovation because the ones that are out ahead move lose to new incumbents, new entries all the time. So you get much more churn of leadership, but you get a much more innovative uh, environment and uh, the general fitness rises um, uh, in a much more predictable way without these great crashes. So the key thing here is that attacking the dragons, the big guys, the ones that are so visible, doesn't generally work. The ecosystem has to be made more fit. What does that mean? Well, there's a couple of different ways to do this. Um, so the, the way that, comes with an ax, right? Is you just simply limit network power. Like for instance, if you say nobody on social media can have more than 10 followers, period, right? And that would kill almost all of the fake news immediately. It would just wipe out uh, uh, cascades, panics, things like that. Information would certainly serve, still tra uh, travel, but it would travel much more slowly. Um, 10 is an extreme, maybe you make it 100, but it would have the same effect. For instance, if you look at anti-vaccine uh, uh, information in the United States, it's principally the result of a very small number of people with a very large number of connections. So modulating that uh, is uh, a thing. If you don't like that hard limit, you could do something else. You could tax entities in the network proportional to the square of the degree of connections, because that is the square of degree of connections is an estimate of the dominance power that an agent has. So in other words, um, Facebook ought to be taxed proportional to the number square of the number of people that use it. But what would this do? Well, small new companies would not be taxed. Medium companies would have a very low tax, but disproportionately dominant ones would have a huge tax burden. And of course, that would tend to make the distribution of fitness flatter and, and better. You can imagine this also, for instance, in the political domain, where lots of money to, to push your message for politics might be something that is discouraged by a tax also, so that people can have more choice and you get less lock-in by incumbents. And of course, the thing that people immediately think about being able to enforce a stable distribution and avoid cascades is just raise the base level of fitness, educate people, make them better, make them more connected, get them involved. Um, and people have been saying this and recommending this for probably centuries. <laughs> yes, this is a really good solution and is really hard. Uh, it has never, to my knowledge, really worked. So I'm a bias for the uh, tax proportional to the square degree of connections. And we have a paper uh, that's at the Stanford Anti-Monopoly Legal uh, Endeavor, a journal paper on law, showing how this could be done in Europe, in the US, without new laws. This could just be a regulatory change that would uh, pretty much immediately stop the dominance, uh, uh, the disproportionate dominance that we see in the internet and in social media. Recognizing that free talking on social media is not a right, it's a business. Influencers make money off of it. They ought to be taxed. Okay? So I'm I'm for this tax thing. So um let's move on. I've talked to you about the theory of how we make decisions and what is wrong and dangerous about our decision making process. So what's the situation out there today? So we have a website which is called inequality.media.mit that includes uh, mobility data for about 10% of the American population, the 11 largest metropolitan areas. And what we find is we find a very disturbing phenomenon. 
which is that segregation, so, and this is, we're talking about financial segregation, rich versus poor, is not just a function of neighborhoods being poor or rich, it's not residential, it has to do with behavior. So poor people don't like to go to the places that rich people do, even if the cost is the same. Rich people almost never go to the places that the poor people do because they feel uncomfortable. And as a consequence, more than 50% of segregation in our world is due to these uh, subtle uh, discriminatory segregationist types of uh, uh, cues or social influences that leave the society very segregated. Now, this lack of mixing means that ideas and opportunities propagate very slowly. And it is arguably, and I think strongly arguably, the, the source of loss of trust in institutions because you never interact with the people who are in power, of inequality because of changes, lack of opportunity. In fact, these patterns of mobility do a tremendously good job at predicting crime, intergenerational mobility, do the kids grow up good, um, uh, life expectancy, as well as uh, income. So arguably the major difference problem in our societies has to do with this lack of diffusion of ideas and opportunities between different socioeconomic groups. Uh, and we have a number of papers on this. I've made these slides available uh, to the organizers for those of you who are registered. They're not for public uh, posting. Um, so what people have always said is, well, let's go to social media. Social media, anybody can talk to anybody. So this is a paper we had at the Royal Society uh, a year and a half ago, showing that physical mobility is extremely uh, uh, segregated. So. But these things show the vertical axis is where you live, horizontal axis is where you go. The numbers from zero to nine are your income category. So uh, zeros are, um, are poor people, uh, eights are rich people. I think I have that right. Um, and what you can see is you can see poor people never go to rich places. Rich people never go to poor places, but even more so, lower middle class people don't mix with upper middle class people. Lower middle class people don't mix with poor people. It's an extremely stratified society. It's true in mobility, it's true in shopping behavior, where it might be a little more predictable, but it's also true even if you control for money. And on social media, you see exactly the same sort of segregation. And in fact, if you look at the, what people talk about on things like Twitter, you find that uh, the higher income people will talk about completely different things than the lower income people. And both of them are different than what the middle class talks about. So these are eigenvectors of, of topics uh, for the sort of Twitter sphere where what we've looked at is topics, hashtags, as a function of income. So um, we live in these societies that are enormously segregated. We get these fads and, and uh, fears that propagate within these levels of socioeconomic class, but don't spread to the rest of society. Uh, and so what we have is we have all these groups running around scared, uh, uh, fanatics of various sorts, um, and we're not talking to each other. So how can we fix the situation? Well, obviously you need to encourage greater uh, communication and mixing between people. That's the sort of evolutionary way. That's where this math that I showed you about optimal decision-making uh, uh, suggests. And, um, what we've done over the several years is 
build tools that allow you to do some very interesting things by identifying people who mix together and influence each other. So the simple model is basically when people interact with each other, when they know each other, when they value each other's uh, inputs, you see that a message from A to B is often reciprocated from B to A. Or equivalently in the real world, when A person A shows up, person B usually shows up. Or when person B shows up, person A shows up. You hang out with your friends. You talk to the people you trust. And you can characterize this statistically fairly easily in this way. Um, and if you do that, uh, what you find is that you get a nearly perfect picture of social structure just by that simple reciprocity nature. Uh, so this is uh, about 100 people for a year around MIT, but I'll tell you that they're not very humans too. And we were able by just looking at this mutual information, this predictive this reciprocity, we were able to predict with 95% accuracy who you would say is in your closer circle of friends, who would you say was in your work group, and who was the boss. So the circle of friends are people whose behavior is your, where you have mutual reciprocity, predictive reciprocity uh, out of work time. The work group are the people where you have this sort of predictive reciprocity during work time. And the boss is the one that's asymmetric. When he shows up, you show up, but when you show up, he doesn't always. So that is amazing accuracy for parsing social structure. And in this case, this was just Bluetooth measurements. There's no semantics at all. It's unidimensional, just this sort of predictive relationship, influence relationship. Um, and this is an example. So for instance, you know, Proximity from Bluetooth, look for reciprocity. If you get reciprocity, and this is a paper from 2006 during out of work times, like weekends, then they'll be close friends and they trust each other also if you ask them questions. So, work hours, it's people who show up at the same time. Again, they trust them. In fact, if you look at social media, and this is a much later paper, 2011, so this is a group of 130 people for a year and a half. And what we did is we looked at all of their social media uh, postings, and then we asked them questions like, well, would you let this person drive your car? Would you loan them $100? Would you let them babysit your, your child? And we found we were 94% accurate at predicting the answers to trust behaviors. In other words, predicting the amount of trust between people. Just simply looking at reciprocity frequency between people. Nothing about the people, no facts about the individuals, just do they value each other enough to be able to uh, respond to each other regularly. So you can read the paper. And what's interesting is, is that it's that class of people that you trust and value, that you have this reciprocity, reciprocal relationship with, that are enormously uh, impactful in changing your behavior. So we did an experiment where we gave incentives to your reciprocity people, your friends, ones who trust behavior, versus giving you an incentive directly. And this was to be more active and more helpful. And what we found is that uh, incentives to your friends, to your Re reciprocal connections were four times more effective, four times more effective than incentives to the individual. And we've done this in Europe to get people to save power, you know, to save electricity. We've done it to do health. We've done it for kids to get them to pay attention at school. Um, this is a general property of humans, is that we have reciprocity, reciprocal relationships, with people we value. Um, oops, 
somebody wants to annotate. I shouldn't have done that. Um, now I can't move my slides because somebody's annotating. There we go. So, um, what can we do to help social media? Well, we can bias it to focus on reciprocal ties, the people that you have a valuable relationship with, the people that influence your behavior most frequently and most strongly. And that has the advantage from all these other experiments we've done to resulting in better decision making and collective action. So there are some simple user interfaces you could do. For instance, you could make your reciprocal ties more available, put them at the top of any sort of list in social media. You could limit the out to be, in other words, the connectivity of uh, people who are not your reciprocal friends. So in other words, you're not gonna be bombarded by those influences, perhaps you tax the influences. Um, and the explanation of why this works is that reciprocal ties is usually a small number, six to 10, are the ones that have value to you. These are the ones you always indulge in. They're the ones that get back to you. You have mutual value. And you will be much more careful and have a much better conversation with them because there are reputational consequences. You value those relationships. You're not going to spam them with random things. You're going to have real conversations with them instead of spreading misinformation. And we've had experiments that show that this actually works pretty well. Um, the final thing I wanted to talk about is this type of thinking on steroids. So um, a lot of social media uh, is well, these fads, influencers, but some of it is by state actors. Some of it is by large organizations that are trying to cause panic or trying to cause various sorts of cascade behavior. And you'd like to find those. Um, and you can find them using the same type of technology. So for instance, this is just a, a small experiment. Uh, we took, uh, in this case, sort of postings uh, by people where there was, random, there was a signal in them. They were trying to influence you. But the signal to noise, noise ratio was one. So there's no analysis of each individual person that will tell you that there's an agenda to change your behavior. This is not possible. However, if you look at mutual information between these, if you look at coincident behavior, how predictable one is from the other, you can find that these people are actually working together and uh, that the tweets of one person or the action of one person precipitates the action of the other person reliably and vice versa. There's a coordination between them. And then you can identify which things they're coordinating about. So in the case of propaganda, you can tell it could be someone who's saying all sorts of things, but they're sneaking little bits of propaganda in there, and it's a network of bots and, and trolls. You can analyze that and pick out the things where they're coordinating in a propaganda-like way. And you can do it with dramatic accuracy. Let me just show you an example. So this is uh, an experiment done with a, a defense agency. So uh, they gave a list of 50 known ISIS Twitter accounts as a sample and held back 74. We used this method to be able to generate the top 200 accounts most likely to be ISIS members. It's a fairly fast thing to do. Uh, out of the top 200, we caught 72 of the 74 that they had held out, making only two mistakes. That's five nines accuracy. This notion of mutual information is dramatically more powerful than you might think, both for cleaning up social media and for finding propaganda. So I'm going to, oh, and incidentally, just to sort of mention this, you don't need raw data to do this. You can use encrypted data and it has 
almost exactly the same performance because you're looking for does this symbol occur whenever that symbol occurs? And uh, the idea is those don't have to be meaningful. You're just looking at mutual information between symbols. So I have a couple books you might be interested in. Social physics, that was back in 2014, 2015. Uh, it sort of talks about this way of thinking in the most recent book, which is just out now, free online MIT Press called Building a New Economy. It talks about taking action and, and the tools you need to be able to build a much more sophisticated digital environment. So let me stop there and take some questions. Thank you. Right. Thank you, uh, Sandy. That is very interesting and uh, thought provoking. I've got tons of questions, but um, that it shouldn't be that shouldn't be coming from me. So let's just see um, what we have in the chat. So can I encourage people to keep on typing questions in the chat? There are two at the moment. Um, actually, one of them is a response to me. So, but I'd be interested to hear your views on that, Sandy. Which is somebody makes the point when I talked about knowledge involving understanding. Somebody made the point that. Computers can only do syntax and understanding is semantic. So computers can never understand. Is that is that the position that you would agree with? Um, um well I think that there are some nuances there. So if you ask to what degree does a uh, uh, understand its environment, that has to do with building Classic to do with perception and responses that are uh, promote the fitness. And if you take that sort of uh, stimulus response sort of view as being the basis for semantics, then you can argue that you can build machines that have at least some rudimentary sense of uh, semantics. Uh, now, clearly, human semantics are much more sophisticated, but um, what a lot of what I've shown you shows is that the semantics follows the syntax, or actually the other way around. The syntax seems to have evolved to capture important features of the semantics. So, for instance, there was a question here about. Uh, reciprocal ties and can't they be used to spread information? And the answer is, of course. Um, but when you do that, you now lose because the reason you have that uh, reciprocal uh, connection is because it was valuable to you. You wouldn't have done it otherwise. And they wouldn't have done it unless it was valuable to them. So you're destroying the relationship should you be found out. But people lie all the time, of course, right? Um, but uh, they tend to do white lies that will be forgiven rather than big lies. Uh, and we call people that do that sort of lying uh, uh, sociopaths. So you're asking, are there sociopaths? There are. Um, are they common? Most people will preserve their reputation and their social network uh, almost against any sort of incentive. So you see that, for instance, in radical group. The idea of being a member of a particular group, has sharing identity, sharing value to them, is so valuable to people that they will go to almost any extent to preserve, preserve that. Okay, thanks, Andy. There, there's a follow-up question here. How to measure reciprocal ties? Well, the way we measure them is we look at, if I send you something, do you send me something back? Do you send me something and then I send you back? If you see uh, reciprocal conversations in both directions, and that happens frequently, then that is a reciprocal time. And you can look at the formal mathematical definitions in the papers if you want. It turns out that it's not really specific to how you measure that. 
It's a pretty robust measure. You can measure it in many different media. You can have variations on this theme. But the idea is, is that there are people that are valuable to me and I reach out to them and I ask them questions and I ask them favors. And some of those people reach back to me. So they're actually my friends. We have this working relationship. Um, and those are the ones we want to get at because those are mutually valuable relationships. And those uh, predict the notion of trust, which is the anticipation of continued value uh, by some definitions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from Nicholas Heitland. Um, do you think that influencers could become even more the network for decision making? Is it dangerous, in your opinion, that difficult topics like politics, financial advice, etc., will be told to viewers in a 60-second story? So my suggestion is is that influencers should be taxed. Okay, there should not be influencers. Right, and that's this disproportional uh, agents idea, is that um, when you have people that have large out degrees, and that's what influencer is, people listen to them, um, that's a business for them, first of all. I mean, whether they make money directly or not, that is a business, and it deserves to be taxed. But it's also the source of panics, fads, cascades, and poor decision making. You need to have a, a whole range of comments, diverse people, diverse uh, 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 inputs. And uh, there's two ways to do that. One is, is you make everybody smarter and more engaged and, and commenting and so forth, uh, which is extraordinarily difficult. Or you say, these people that have somehow uh, masked these huge influences are running a business and, and they need to be uh, taxed for that so that they're much less influencers and much more like uh, a choice that people can make because they're not gonna have that disproportionate power. And unless you actually do something like that, you can guarantee that you will be in a, a, a domain. This is what the mathematical proof says. Unless you do something, you will get fads, cascades, and crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you can make the fitness domain, in other words, the out degree, much more, um, and the dynamics associated with that, the dynamics associated mm -hmm. with that, much more equitable, then you get a, a, a much higher level of decision making but you don't get anybody who dominates for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. So I think yep. that's the basic insight is, is that either you can raise the base level, which is of course desirable, but has proven extraordinarily difficult, or you can tax the ones that have somehow uh, risen to the top so that they don't have this disproportionate, you know, squared uh, error, squared power, uh, uh, influence on things and and aren't uh, in a position to uh, capture that position for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. um, the next question from Francesco Saracino is um, trust is declining in many Western countries and you've argued that trust in others is pivotal. Where would you start from to rebuild trust? So my suggestion was that we have to break down segregation um, and build social capital between socioeconomic groups. And that's not just a matter of residence, it's a matter of many, many, many subtle cultural habits that mean that people from one socioeconomic group don't feel comfortable with a group, the people from another group. Um, and you know, this is a difficult thing. But uh, that, to me, is the source of uh, many of these problems. The reason that the segregation, behavioral segregation, is a problem is that trust is built from reciprocity. If you never talk to the people, you can't trust them. 
the poor people say, oh, those rich people, they're all, all the screw us. And the rich people say, those poor people are despicable, right? Because they never interact with each other. They can have these very extreme opinions. So what do you do about that? Well, it's different. I agree. Um, examples that you might not like, uh, but have proven sort of interesting in the past is societies having a universal service. So when you hit age 18, you go in a, a, a national core where the rich and the poor all go and you help rebuild the country, right? So in the United States, they did that in the 1930s. They've seen things like that after World War II. Um, the core thing is, is then poor people and rich people mix with each other. They see that the other people are actually human also. They build some ties and it tends to rebuild the social capital and therefore trust that we have lost in the last uh, substantial period of time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, there's a question from Victoria Andres. Uh, what do you think about recommender systems, especially in the social media domain? Aren't they dangerous due to preventing us to step out of our own bubble and hearing other opinions and options that could yeah, alter absolutely. our they, they are bubble machines, absolutely. <laughs> um, and and the, um, the problem is, okay, is that um, the, the suggestion for fixing them is adding some noise in there so you get to see other things. It appears that people sort of like that, but not so much. Um, I think what you need to do is you need to very limit the power of recommender systems also. Um, one of the things that is tough about recommender systems um, is that uh, they perform one valuable service, which is putting you in touch with people that are like you. They perform a bad service that they make it so you only talk to people like you, segregation. So if you're a minority of some sort, it's great that you can meet other people that are like you. This is why we see all these minorities becoming much more uh, vocal. They, they now have some way to get in touch and discover each other. At the same time, it promotes a level of segregation of, of, of bubbleness, which is uh, damaging to making collective decisions. And um, it's hard to know exactly what to do about it, uh, but having, well, we're exploring a recommender systems that optimize two things. They optimize, are you gonna like this? But they also optimize social capital. In other words, are they going to cause you to interact with people that are not like you? So mm -hmm. we're trying to put that in as a social good that we want to optimize at the same time that we optimize the search. And in fact, there are other things you would like to put in there to optimize. So, mm -hmm. Um, there's a question from Niels Hachmeister. Um, you've made the point that limiting the number of connections would stop fake news from spreading. However, if information has to travel over more nodes, would that not lead to a Chinese whispers like effect? Uh, information being distorted over time and becoming less reliable. Um, we the evidence is, is is that we are not very sensitive to noise and information. We're really good at figuring that stuff. And one of the properties of digital uh, information is, is that it does not degrade upon replication. So if I do it by speech, yes, it, it degrades very quickly. But if I have a little quote, it's a digital quote, um, it will not degrade even over thousands. So, so, you know, that notion of limiting our degree is one way of doing it. Another way to say is you can't redo things. You can only do a certain amount of uh, forwarding or a certain amount of connection per day. So you can talk to a hundred people a day and that's it. Right? 
and anything that sort of slow down and make the, the smaller voices heard better and not so dominated by the few big ones. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's uh, still more questions coming in. So I guess we'll, we'll take, you know, we'll do another 10 minutes or so. So the next question is from Sergio Allegrezza. Um, we discussed a project linking mobile phone data and census data at the Lux Innovation Anniversary in Luxembourg. My question, where do you stand with this kind of project? Is it still worth pursuing? What are the frontier studies we should envisage? Well, so um, the way I think about that sort of project is this, is, is that today we collect data about neighborhoods for the national census. Every country has it. How many people live here? How many men? How many women? How many children? How much money do they make? Those sort of things. And that sort of data is not seen as being dangerous to individual privacy. It's seen as being really key to management. What I want to do, and what we've shown, is that if you add to that census data three other things, where do people work? Where do people from this neighborhood work? What are the top three places they work? Not the place, but the neighborhood. So the people from this neighborhood work in that neighborhood. Where do they shop? Oh, people in this neighborhood shop in that neighborhood, perhaps on the weekend and this other neighborhood during the day. Where do they play? Oh, they go downtown and they go out to this other thing. Those three things. Using those three things, we can uh, tell how uh, likely it is that the neighborhood is to grow because we can look at how integrated it is. We can tell how segregated the neighborhood is from the rest of society. And that segregation predicts crime, economic outcomes, intergenerational mobility. It's amazing. It is as if you're looking at the flow of blood in the society. Just these aggregate things, right? not individual level data. It's, the, it's like the flow of blood in the society where the blood is cut off segregation. The pieces of society that are cut off do poorly. The ghettos, traditionally, and we have them today, but they're not visible. They're, they're, they're ghettos by subtle behavioral factors. What we need to do is hook them back up to the rest of the social body. And when we do that, we see lower crime, better economic outcomes, kids developing better, et cetera, et cetera. Right? What it, I mean, there's a lot, whole sort of discussion I could give about the mechanisms by which this happens. But these are among the strongest effects in social science. I mean, the, you know, you, these are these are R squareds that are like in the 0.65 area, 0.7 area. It's just amazing, uh, and um, and they haven't dominated our thinking because we focus on the individual. These are not about the individual. These are about how the individual is embedded in society, and how the neighborhood is embedded in society. And we've never had the data to understand that before. So that's something as a simple human you can observe. Um, and now we have this data and we're discovering that we really are social animals. We've learned culture comes from interacting with other people. And, um, and moreover, uh, we are on a continual search to, to better ourselves. We try to find things that are interesting, things that are better, things that are more helpful, things that feel good. We do this all the time. It is perhaps our major type of behavior, a major motivation. It's like, you know, you see animals that are grazing all of the time. We're looking for ideas. All the time. And when we're isolated, when we're not able to search for those ideas, we don't do nearly as well in terms of our outcomes and our families and our kids don't do as well as when we're able to find ideas much more broadly. And, and in some ways, that's a very simple sort of description is the core. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, 
I'm going to take two questions together, which are both about social capital. So one question is, how do you define it mathematically? The other question is, how do you measure it? And how, and, and also, how do you measure reciprocity? Oh, I'm sorry, I was reading about commas. Can you say that again? <laughs> so th th let me, okay, let me just do them one by one. So the first question is, uh, the, term, you, the term social capital has been used in many contexts. What do you mean by it? Is there a satisfactory mathematical definition of social capital? Yeah. Um, yeah, social capital is one of these things that you know, it's used all the time and means nothing because it's not, not a good mathematical definition. When I say that, I mean um, density of uh, reciprocal ties, reciprocal mm -hmm. interaction. Okay. In other words, do you interact with them and do they reach out to you? Okay. And and there's now developing a really strong literature that shows that diversity in those reciprocal ties is perhaps the major predictor of. Uh, outcomes, economic, etc. Okay. And so it maps pretty closely to traditional notions of social capital. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I have, I have, and there are other papers that other people are producing about this, but it's really fairly startling because of the strength and complicated nature of the findings. Mm -hmm. and the the other question uh, was about the measurement question. I suspect it cannot be calculated solely on the network topology. You need some inputs from agents. Um, you know, obviously, at some level, you're completely right. However, it's shocking how good it is to be able to do this purely syntactic. And here's my understanding is that um, if you think about people as trying to continually maximize their situation, find new opportunity, do better, get food on the table, um, then they will preferentially uh, do behaviors that serve that need. I mean, so, so, you know, they'll try and do things that make life better. And when you see a, a, a relationship that people come back to again and again, and that the other agents also participate in, that's a relationship that is creating value for each of the actors. And you don't know what that value is. Maybe they're trading tips on the stock market. Maybe they're watching each other's kids. Who knows, right? But they're creating value. And that notion of value is uh, along those value relationships come all sorts of opportunities, ideas, and that's where we use uh, get our prior probabilities for decisions, et cetera. And if you look at the diversity, for instance, and diversity here is diversity of experience, diversity of uh, network uh, structure, Things like that. Um, those the diversity of those reciprocal connections uh, are enormously good predictors of many of the things that we care about. Uh, and so it's sort of because of this. I mean, I'll say the qualitative. People seem to be very single-minded about um, trying to find things that are interesting and useful. And that's how they structure their social networks. And uh, because of that, the structure of the network and what sort of people are in the network is a uh, extremely good predictor of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But it's not like the semantics don't matter. Of course they matter, right? But we have lived in a century, roughly, where uh, we have focused on the, the semantics at the individual level, cognitive science, rational individuals, all of economics is built around that. Most of cognitive science is built around that. And 
it leaves off at least 50% of the picture. That's my point, right? And so I'm gonna say, hey, let's look at this other 50% of the picture. Because <laughs> we could do so much better if we were paying attention to that also. Mm -hmm. It's not like an either or. You know, there's system one and system two. We don't use system two all that much, but we do it when it's critical or it's important. And a good sort of qualitative thing is that they're equally important, or both important. Um, there's a question from Dima Daman, um, who says, what about the information that is read, but it's not passed on? So it stops somewhere. Somebody decides not to pass something on. Is that important? Uh, yeah, so you have a loss function. Um, that, uh, for this propagation of opportunities. But what's, uh, again, what's surprising is, is that that doesn't seem to vary a lot across situations or even across societies for the fun of it. Um, so when we look at, for instance, diversity of interaction versus economic growth, you get pretty much the same numbers in Asia and Europe and Africa and Asia. It's just not that different. Um, so yes, there's this sort of lossy transmission. Uh, people not saying things. But again, I think that people are so tuned towards new opportunities and looking for new opportunities, things that make them feel good, um, that that, uh, that coefficient of loss may be surprisingly small during repeated transactions. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, there's a question from Sandra Pauser. Uh, when developing your sociometric patches at MIT, you highlight the importance of nonverbal behaviors. How do you see its influence regarding mediums such as social media and building trust and reciprocal ties? Which specific variables measured by sociometers would you recommend in this case? So um, what's being talked about here is back in uh, 2004, 2006, those sorts of years, we built these little badge-like things that could uh, pay attention to whether you were talking to somebody or not, right? So we could get the communication at work within an organization. And we found that there were, in general, uh, two, maybe three factors that were critical for the innovation, the productivity, the happiness of the agents in organizations. One was, um, engagement with other people within your work group? Do you talk to the other people in your work group? Uh, do you talk to all of them? Do all of them talk to each other? So a measure of engagement there. That's mathematical version of that. Do you explore? Do you talk to people outside your work group? And uh, do you harvest these ideas, roughly, is what it's asking. But, but that notion of talking to people outside uh, is directly predictive of rates of innovation uh, and also resilience of the organization in times of stress. And then there's a sort of overall energy. It's like, do you talk to two people during the day or five people during the day? 10 people. Right? People need a certain amount of good social interaction to, uh, to stay in a good mood, to feel good, to actually to maintain mental health. It's one of the primary predictors of mental health. And so, um, again, surprisingly large, increasing, not a small factor at all. Um, and so, you know, um, the badges are a little weird because, you know, you're wearing this tracking device on. People would argue it's not so different than having a cell phone. Um, but the way uh, that those were for experiments. You see companies out there trying to look at these types of things again, but there are ways of doing this that don't uh, give you data about individuals. They give you data only about groups of people. Like, you know, does this group actually talk to itself? 
the, the people in the group talk to each other. There's no individual there, at least about the, the group and we try to enforce it so that we can't figure out about individuals and so forth. So privacy is always a concern. That's one of the reasons I look at the syntax versus semantics preferentially. And one of the reasons I look at groups of people and group interaction rather than individual interactions. Because whenever you look at semantics and individuals, you are now in bad places with respect to privacy. You do it as an experiment so that people can agree. But you run the risk that that technology that you develop is going to be applied indiscriminately to violate people's privacy. Whereas if you find relationships that inherently do not attack privacy because they're anonymous, they're aggregate, et cetera, right? Then those are things that even if they become commercialized, they're not going to tear society apart. So that's why I like to focus my science on things that could be scaled without having uh, a problem. I should probably uh, leave off here in a bit. Sometime. Yes. One yes. or two more questions. Sure. Well, I I was I was just about to choose one last one, which is probably a bit a bit broad, but. Um, so Sergio Alegreza asks whether data science has anything to say about the old philosophical question of free will against social influence. Yeah, so um, I think, and there was another question about, you know, you know, how do you actually use some of this? So the free will versus social influence. So if you take a, a the sort of best understanding that I have of it anyhow is that we have this system one way of thinking, an automatic, very fast way, which is largely programmed by our social experience. We think of it as a rule-based system for taking in perceptual inputs and generating action. And we can modify our own rule base, but it's really difficult. Uh, you have to like to essentially do behavioral conditioning. This is why it's so hard to stop smoking or stop drinking and things like that, right? Um, and then we have our system two, which we don't use nearly as often. It's really tough, but it really is free will. We're just thinking it out, right? And so our thought is a mix of both of these things, the social and, uh, and the individual. And, you, and so the classic positions of, Free will versus not is, I'll use the word stupid. It's neither. It's a combination. We have a large fraction of our behavior determined uh, or probabilistically determined by social context. We call that culture. It's good. This is why we can live together, build cities, blah, blah, blah. It's not bad, okay? But it's not all of us. We also have free will, and we occasionally break out of the culture. We do things that are not like everybody else. We make decisions where there's no social context to guide us. Um, and those are the system two things. Uh, and so it's not, I mean, the thing that's wrong with a lot of the classic analyses is that they're, they don't take into account that we are more complicated, we're not a unified one type of thinking. System one, we've got system two. We've got a highly socially programmed way of thinking that we use most of the time, and we've got an individual thinking which we use sometimes. Um, and uh, I should push off. Uh, I sent uh, uh, the PowerPoint uh, PDF of that. It has all the citations. And um, if you I was trying to think what the best sort of thing is. There's the books have references to things, but there's also, uh, I could put together a little care package of, of paper references if there was real uh, interest in it. You know, give that to Peter for posting or something. Sure, sure. sure. That, would, that would be great. Was um, I mean, I I'm going to, I'm going to stop the Q and a here. It's been utterly fascinating and thank you, uh, Sandy for such a. Uh,
but you're really interesting mm -hmm. talk and thank for everyone for uh for being here and their uh, questions and i'm going to hand over back to christian as 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 Spartak is the official host of uh, of this session so thanks a lot sandy and christian back to you Thank you, Thank Peter. You so, so I think it, it is time now to come to an end of this symposium. Professor Pantheon, Professor Friach, many thanks for your time and your inspirational words. I would like to thank each of you who joined us today for your participation. Hope to see you again for another event organized by the European Association for Data Science. Goodbye.